Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today in the uh, uh, leadership lecture series uh, interactive session with Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia. You were requested to please take your seats. Dr. Aluwalia is already here in the chamber and we will start the session very soon. Stock Exchange Limit room uh, from this on, on the second floor to the venue. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome you to the inaugural edition of the uh, Leadership Lecture Series of the Bengal Chamber with Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia. I would request Mr. Amburish Dashup, the President of the Bengal Chamber, Mr. Shutanu Ghosh, President Designate of the Bengal Chamber, to escort Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia to this dais. I would also request Mr. Shunil Min, uh, Mitro, uh, Chairperson of the Economic Affairs Committee of the Bengal Chamber and former uh, Finance Secretary of Government of India to please join us in the dais. I would request now our President, Mr. Amburish Dashkupto, to please deliver the formal welcome address. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you today in Kolkata at this historic Bengal Chamber premises for a very special event, the first lecture in the Bengal Chamber Leadership Lecture Series. As I was walking with uh, Dr. Uh, Montek Singh Aluwalia on the hallway, on this walkway, he was asking me why is this called a leadership series. So I explained to him that we actually bring in leaders in each of these areas to talk to us so that by listening to those leaders, we in our own industry, in our state also can eventually turn out to be a leader in future in some, on some days. So that's the objective that more we hear them out, more we get to know of what's happening in our country, what's happening in the world, what's the future plan, more wiser we get, more possibly the industry, the academicians and everything here in our state will flourish. Keeping that in mind, that to make everybody here wiser, the Bengal Chamber in continuation of its efforts to being relevant to trade, industry and commerce has traditionally been a forum for stalwarts to meet and share perspectives on the growth and the development issues. So it is not also only Dr. Aluwalia talking, it's also that the leading people from the industry and the academics or from any other areas in the Bengal would also love to share their views about what's happening in their own areas so that Dr. Aluwalia also get to know what, what, what's happening in our state and go back with a good perception or go back with a right perception about what's happening out here. This is the inaugural edition of this special forum and I'm delighted and privileged to announce our very eminent speaker for this first edition and we're grateful to him also is Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia for accepting this. He of course needs no introduction but I will be failing in my duty if I still do not give a little bit of his background to all of you. <coughs> Together with Dr. Manmohan Singh, Dr. Aluwalia is the architect of the India's economic liberalization. He was the deputy chairman of the Planning Commission of India, a position which carries the rank of a cabinet minister. He has been a key figure in India's economic reforms from the mid-1980s onwards. For his outstanding contribution to economic policy and public service, he was conferred the prestigious award Padma Vibhushan by President of India in 2011. He joined the Government of India in 1979 as economic advisor in the Ministry of Finance after which he held a series of positions including Special Secretary to the Prime Minister, Commerce Secretary, Secretary in the Department of Economic Affairs, Finance Secretary in the Ministry of Finance, Member of the Planning Commission and Member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. In 2001, he was appointed as the first director of the newly created Independent Evaluation Office of the International Monetary Fund. He resigned the position in 2004 to take up the position of Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission as part of the United Progressive Alliance Government in New Delhi. Dr. Aluwalia has been, of course, a key figure in the India economic reform policies. He has consistently pushed for economic reforms involving a shift from the earlier reliance on extensive government control over the economy with high levels of protection to a much more open economy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia.
amid this backdrop of why Bengal Chamber organizes such event, back, background of Dr. Aluwalia, I'm really looking forward to a session which will be an enthusiastic session, a very good deliberation amongst us, a discourse from him as well as an interaction from you. Uh, <coughs> And I really wish and look forward to a very lovely, uh, interesting session tonight. May I now request uh, Mr. Sunil Mitra, Chairperson, Economic Affairs Committee of the Bengal Chamber and formerly Revenue and Finance Secretary, Government of India, to come up and take the proceedings forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Aluwalia, ladies and gentlemen, firstly I should and will thank the Bengal Chamber for having uh, asked me to be here and uh, to take forward or moderate this session. Uh, I have also been tasked with setting the theme for today's discussion. Now, I don't think I am the right person to do that, but what I would, this is essentially a, a first of a kind. So it is, a, it is the first session of first lecture that we are holding and we will have others, I'm sure. But essentially when you ask, you know, for uh, a leader, in this case, in the structural reform process, when you ask, when you ask for, when you ask for somebody like him to speak, and it's difficult to set a theme. But notwithstanding that, I'll, I'll mention a few thoughts uh, that I have, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, they would help uh, in taking this session forward. See, uh, all of us sometimes feel puzzled uh, when we read that and when we know that India is indeed at a crossroads today. On the one hand, we hear that the foreign direct investment is increasing. We hear that global rating agencies and uh, institutions are reviewing their earlier pessimistic uh, opinions on India's growth. And on the other hand, India still continues to be home to one third of the world's poor. Now, while that is a contextual background and to my mind a contextual uh, position in which we are today. There are a number of things that have happened and which yield a lot of promise for the future. We must build on those and we, as, we, as we chart our way forward and among these there, are, there is this big uh, 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 one billion Aadhaar cards that have gone out, you know, to, to uh, distribute it to the people of India, which to, our, to my mind is a huge technology driven initiative, which can have its application in a large number of things. As a matter of fact, uh, the petroleum subsidy, the LPG subsidy issue, has, has been an example of use of the, uh, of the Aadhaar cards, and it has worked. One billion Indians today have a unique identity and a means for verification of that identity. So it's this itself, and as we go forward, there is another, there are, we are adding a million more, I'm told, a day, and it won't be very far uh, away that all of India will have similar identities which will, which will allow a number of technology driven initiatives that can take, you know, that, that can take things forward. But what that will need is essentially a lot of structural reform. And it will need a polit strong political will to move it. It will also need, as the Aadhaar experience has shown, and sir, you will remember, sir, it was your initiative in the Planning Commission which really gave birth to the, uh, to the Aadhaar uh, effort. And they, 
as a matter of fact, uh, there are a whole range of things which uh, are very exciting and can be experimented with. And you, the use of technology, getting the best minds from the uh, from technology from the technology sector, and with the overall government, you know, presence in regulation, I think that that's a great opportunity that we have today. The another th uh, couple of other things that uh, I have uh, I have noted. Uh, yesterday's Times of India uh, reports that there's been a, a, a demand of 84 million persons in the year 2015-16 up till the third week of March under the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. This is an increase of 15% over the 2014-15 demand of 73 million jobs. And while on an average the scheme has been able to provide not even half the assured days of engagement at work, 16 million demands for jobs under the scheme could not be provided, almost 19% of the people who wanted such jobs. This doesn't speak well for the employment uh, scene, particularly in the rural areas, and th th there is definitely a need to do something about this. This is another imperative that I think we need to, we need to address. On the, taking the Aadhaar theme a little further, government spends almost 3.5% of its JD, GDP, of the national GDP, or around 3 trillion rupees on subsidies, particularly as a part of social net programs. Perhaps there is a way, there is, there is a need to build upon the LPG initiative and see how direct transfers can be made more effective. One other, one other point uh, is about the, about the, the, the Constitution of India allocates certain areas for states to work in and certain areas for the union government. There is a, there is a fair deal of policy that the central government makes, but implementation is largely in the hands of the union, of the states. These are also the socially more important sectors where we are lagging behind. Now, is there a case for a strong cooperative federalism to develop between the states and the central government in much more than just lip service, but actually in looking at the major initiatives that need, need to be driven and for modeling programs of action in states that will, actually, that will move these forward. This uh, is something which sir, we would, uh, I think, benefit from your, your views on because uh, you have been associated with the allocation of both plan and non-plan re uh, resources of the government to states as well as to the union government in your tenure in the planning commission. I will, I will leave it here. I, we will have occasion to uh, as we go into the uh, next uh, interactive session to uh, discuss and comment upon a number of other issues with broadly setting a frame that I have attempted to do. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Aluwalia to present and deliver the first of the annual leadership lecture series of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Mitra, Mr. Das Gupta, Dr. Ghosh, friends, uh, let me first of all begin by, by saying that I'm greatly honored at being invited to kick off this new leadership lecture series. Actually, Sunil, uh, with whom I've had the pleasure of working when we were both in the government of India, had invited me quite some time ago to come, and I apologize that for a variety of 
other constraints. I wasn't able to do it earlier, uh, but I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you also for showing me around this quite impressive bit of Indian heritage. Kolkata heritage, but also Indian heritage. You have a really nice and impressive building, uh, which I'm sure is going to inspire all kinds of thoughts for the future. Uh, you know, I was told that um, I'm being invited not to deliver a, a sort of a standard lecture, but rather to kick off a conversation. And I think Sunil has already covered the broad areas. Uh, I've been told I should speak for about half an hour and actually encourage you to raise questions uh, so that uh, rather than the questions just being of a clarificatory nature, they may actually lead us into areas that you think need to be explored uh, more thoroughly than I'm going to do in my original uh, initial remarks. You know, I thought that what we need uh, at this point uh, is to look ahead and answer the question or try to address the question which is in the minds of most people uh, that what are the prospects for India in the years ahead. And we've just gone through, you know, we, we, we keep going through elections. We have national elections, state elections. You're about to have an election. Uh, so one of the problems is that when elections are going on, uh, the political discourse tends to be sort of very focused on whatever the current concerns are. And it's, it's less easy to focus on longer term issues. So I, what I'm going to say has very little to do uh, with whatever is going on right now. It does have to do with assessing what India has been doing over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and it's looking ahead at what might actually be possible. So I mean the first simple question that uh, comes up in people's minds, it's absolutely true that in the last 10 years or so, uh, the global perception of India's performance has actually improved very substantially. You know, at any given time, uh, things can look good or bad. So I think you need to separate out, uh, uh, if you like, the noise from the signal. So there have been times when people get very enthusiastic, then there are times they get very depressed. Uh, but I would say that globally, uh, people perceive India today to be somewhat very different from what they did 10 or 12 years ago. And I think that perception is simply uh, the consequence of actual performance. Um, reference has been made to the fact that the economy was liberalized. That was quite some time ago. I mean, this is the 25th year <laughs> anniversary of the original liberalization, if you date that from 1991. Uh, in some sense, many of these things were being implemented in a more gradual way earlier. But I think the real difference is that uh, the impact of a lot of what was done in the 90s didn't get felt immediately. And I think one of the reasons that it didn't get felt immediately was that it was done very gradually. I mean, it was not as if uh, we knew what the path was, but we were not in a political environment where there was even a consensus that let's get it all done in the next three years. It was more like the crisis uh, provided a tremendous opportunity to push in a particular direction. Uh, once the crisis was over, and the crisis was actually over by 19, late 1992 or early 1993, the balance of payments crisis, then the pressure to change sort of moderated, but the good news is that the change actually continued. However, it continued at a very steady pace. And uh, you know, I won't go on and on about this because this is the story of the change throughout since then. I mean, we get a lot of talk but actually the movement is modest. And I think that is a reflection of a democratic polity. Because the democratic polity always holds you back. Uh, it's not easy to make huge changes. Uh, and since you have to listen to whoever may be adversely affected, uh, the net effect is that you know, things are slower than they should be. It's very important to realize why that's so. Because, you know, when you try to make changes, I mean, the people who are going to be adversely affected know exactly that they might be adversely affected. Many more people may be beneficially affected 
even the ones who are adversely affected may find new opportunities opening up which they themselves would realize three four years down the road are really beneficial for them but they're not there expressing that point of view because they don't know it for sure so the net effect at any given time is that things move more slowly and you can take credit for it as a democracy that you're carrying people along rather than pushing them because you don't actually have the power to push. Uh, I mean, I always tell my friends that, you know, India should never be given any credit for being a democracy. We don't actually have a choice. So anyone who tries to do it differently will find that it won't work. Having said that, after this long effect, uh, delayed effect, uh, the real impact of these cumulative changes began to become evident around about, I would say, 2003 or so. That's when the first big growth rate happened. And from about 2003 right up to the global financial crisis of 2008, um, the economy actually grew at faster than 8%. So naturally, it greater this was it never happened before then of course we were hit by the global crisis like everyone was uh, maybe we, uh, we we slowed down then we picked up pretty quickly then we were hit again by the eurozone crisis we had problems of our own as a result of the faster growth so some of the slowing down in the last couple of years of the UPA cannot be attributed only to the global crisis I think uh, my good friend, the governor of the RBI, Raghuram Rajan, in a public address that he gave in New York, uh, during that slowdown period said that one third of the slowdown is due to global factors and two thirds is due to our own constraints. So, and I think that's not an unreasonable uh, uh, characterization. But you know, having said all that, uh, if you take a 12 year period from something like 2003 to about 2014 or 15, it's a fairly long period, where pluses and minuses get averaged out. Uh, the Indian economy grew at 7.7%. Now, you know, the only economy that did better than us, and it did significantly better than us, is China. And I think the world uh, doesn't look at India every day. I mean, our problem is that we look at India every day TV news, breaking news, it's almost impossible uh, to work out what the underlying trends are. Uh, but to, when, when for 12 years an economy grows at an average of 7.7% through global crises and non-global crises, uh, most people around the world kind of assume that, well, uh, this economy is now capable of growing at 77 and there's no reason why that won't happen for the next 10 years. And I think that is what has made the difference because uh, we are a large economy, certainly in terms of people, uh, not that large in terms of GDP. I mean, we are about one-fourth uh, China's size or something like that. Uh, but still, it's a significant economy and a significant economy starting to grow at 77 makes a lot of difference. Most people assume that, you know, unless we muck it up, and we should not uh, rule out mucking things up. And if things do get mucked up, unless we muck it up, if we remain on the ball and remain doing the right things, then we could keep growing at that, at that rate. Now, the importance of this has hugely increased in recent years because the global growth prospects have also uh, deteriorated. The, in the industrialized world, uh, there are economic problems. I'm sure they'll get over them, but there's no doubt that uh, the mood in the industrialized world is at the moment very negative. Japan has problems, Europe has problems, uh, the United States has fewer problems, uh, but they have their own problems. And certainly, too many pe not too many people are assuming uh, the rapid growth will continue the way it has in the past. Uh, on the other hand, on the developing country side, countries that were heavily dependent on commodities are in bad shape with the collapse of oil prices. We're actually a user of petroleum, a net importer. So other things being the same, India benefits from a big decline in oil prices. 
we don't actually benefit from the slowdown in global growth which that causes. So one should not be, one should not be ignoring the fact that yes, there are costs also, but the pure decline in commodity prices helps India. And on the other hand, China has run into its own set of constraints, having grown for 30 years at 10%. It's now slowing down. And you know, if you, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily view that as criticism because I think the Chinese were smart enough to capitalize on the tremendous growth prospects of an open economy at a time when the world was growing rapidly and welcoming their exports. So they were able to grow at 10%. But now the world isn't growing rapidly uh, and therefore they have to rework uh, their domestic economic strategy to be more dependent on domestic demand. Uh, they've tried to do something, uh, but the impact on their own growth rate is actually more negative than at one time was thought to be the case. And this year, the Chinese will probably grow at about 6.5%, uh, whereas India is being projected to grow at 7.6%. Now, you know, I don't think we should overhype this because this, uh, to say India has overtaken China, which you sometimes hear, uh, I mean, they are four times our per capita income. And what we've done is we've overtaken them in terms of growth rate. But still, uh, for, uh, for an environment, for a background where we've been lagging behind in growth for 30 years, uh, to be a little faster is a good thing from our point of view. Of course, the question then arises, uh, is it really true that the world could be in all this mess and even China could lose momentum, but that India would continue to grow at 7.5 or is there going to be some delayed negative effect on us? And I think that's something we have to keep in mind because one obvious negative effect is exports. I mean, Indian exports have been negative for 15 months in a row. Uh, you could argue that, you know, uh, yes, that's a loss of uh, a demand factor. You could argue that we can offset that by having a sufficient growth of domestic demand, hopefully in investment, not consumption, but investment, hopefully in infrastructure, which is what we really need. And then, of course, the question arises that if you can't export and you're doing all this demand expansion, uh, how are you going to manage the balance of payments? Well, I mean, the short answer to that is that if the world wants to invest a lot in India for the next maybe five years, ten years or something, uh, it may be possible to manage the balance of payments uh, if we take a positive approach to foreign direct investment. And I think from a political point of view, one of the messages that the world has got is that through multiple changes of government, the government of India does want to attract foreign direct investment. That was certainly the message that was being given during the UPA regime. That seems to be the message that's been given by the present government. And I think people perceive that, you know, if the scope for India to absorb investment, if we get all our other policies right, is large enough that for a few years at least, the somewhat weaker export performance uh, in terms of its impact on the balance of payments uh, can be overcome, particularly if oil prices remain low. And the good news there is that nobody is predicting that oil prices will shoot up. Now, you know, one of the good things about uh, looking at the global economy is it can change very rapidly. Nobody would have predicted a year ago that oil prices will be where they are now. But I think the smart thing to do is to be nimble to recognize that things can change very rapidly, but to chalk out a strategy based on what it looks like right now. And I think a strategy for India, which says that, look, uh, our domestic constraints are dominantly in the area of poor infrastructure, poor logistics, poor ease of doing business, and things like that. Uh, and we could uh, make up uh, any weakness on the balance of payments front uh, by running a system uh, which is welcoming of foreign inflows. Uh, we are not actually hugely exposed to them right now. Uh, and I think that with, with continuing soft oil prices, that gives you a scope to maintain the 7.5% that I talked about. Now, you know, 